Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. This one is brought to you by Wondrium. Wondrium is a series of college-level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by The Teaching Company. It brings you engaging educational content through short-form videos, long-form courses, tutorials, how-to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, and more. Those of you that know this show and know me know that I'm a big fan. I have two uh, great courses myself, one on skepticism, one on conspiracies. But I'm going to tell you about today this one, which I just started. As you can see, I'm halfway through lecture number two. This one's called Mysteries of Modern Physics, Time. This one's on time. Sean Carroll, my friend and colleague from Caltech, uh, is doing this one. 24 30-minute lectures. You can get these all for the price of one year for two full years. Two years for the price of one. It's a subscription service. You just log in and you can start listening to any course you want. I stopped at, uh, at on lecture two because I got distracted by going off to a different course. Uh, but that's the beauty. You just come back to it and it's right there. The whole system is nicely streamed right into your phone and then into your ears. And you can get that two for one, two years for the price of one. If you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Shermer, S-H-E-R-M-E-R. You know that. So check it out. Why would you not go for this two years for the price of one? It's a great deal. And they have literally hundreds of courses like this and hundreds more of other tutorials and short form um, courses and documentaries and documentary series, film shorts and so on. It's just great. All right. Check it out. Oh, I meant to remind you, the publisher of Skeptic Magazine still in print look at that a print magazine we're now four color throughout check it out you can pick it up at any bookstore or go to skeptic.com click under magazine you can subscribe and if you want to support the show we are a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization skeptic society that is that uh, owns this podcast so you can make your donations there at skeptic.com slash donate and we take all credit cards and paypal and all that good stuff all right my guest today is John Lyle, a historian of science and the American intelligence community. He earned a PhD in history from the University of Texas and has taught courses on U.S. history, cyberspace, and information warfare at the University of Texas, Louisiana Tech University, and Austin Community College. His writing has appeared in Scientific American, Smithsonian Magazine, Skeptic Magazine, yay, <laughs> uh, the Journal of Intelligence History, did you know there was a Journal of Intelligence History? And this is not about IQ testing. This is about <laughs> the subject of today. And Physics and Perspective, uh, the Dirty Tricks Department. This is his new book, his first book. Uh, the D Dirty Tricks Department, there it is. Stanley Lovell, the OSS, and the Masterminds of World War II Secret Warfare. This is the precursor to the CIA. So we'll get into all that in a minute. In volume 25, number two of Skeptic, he wrote about MK Ultra, the CIA program in search of mind control technology. Nice to see you, John. How's it going? It's great. Thanks so much for having me. I've been <laughs> well, a long, long time fan of the podcast and the Believing Brain and the Moral Arc, your books had a big impact on me. So thanks so oh much. Oh my for God. Having me. So you're the one. All right. Okay. It's good, <laughs> yeah. to, good to finally meet that. No, <laughs> just kidding. So this is your first book. So give us a little bit of background here uh, on history of science, what, how you got interested in that, and then what propelled you into the intelligence community? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, you know, my, my parents, my mother was a science teacher. My dad was a history teacher. So you'd think that I would have come through the history of science, maybe through them. Um, but I, I don't think that's the case, actually. I think when I got to college, I went to Texas A&M. Um, I had an interest in history and I kind of, I took some history of science classes. And that's when I really realized, oh, this is what I, what I want to do. I'm reading these books on my spare time anyway. I want to look more into this. So I went to the University of Texas for my PhD um, in the history of science, and I, I focused on kind of the American intelligence community. Uh, my dissertation was on this group of scientists in the Cold War called the Science Attaches and their connection kind of to the CIA. But through that, I started hearing stories about different um, kind of scientific projects that had been taken or undertaken during World War II, things like bat bombs and glowing foxes and all these kind of weapons and disguises and documents that I talk about in this book. And I realized that they're all kind of connected in this figure of Stanley Lovell. So that's how I came really to write this book is I, I, I had heard of all these interesting stories. And then once I realized there was, they all seemed to be connected to Lovell, then I knew I had to tell the story. It was just too good to let 
you know, let's sit there. <laughs> yeah, it's a great read. Now, I listened to it on audio, uh, and it's like a Tom Clancy novel. They should make a movie out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they would. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's, that's in the works, or I don't know if that's oh, well, going to happen. It's, cra- it's crazy stuff. I mean, it's James Bond kind of stuff, right? It is, yeah. Really, I mean... It's it's it goes with the quote of truth is stranger than fiction. If somebody were to make up some of this st- stuff and put it in a novel, you might think, okay, they went a little overboard there. But <laughs> now this stuff is true, which makes it even more exciting to me. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into all the crazy bat bombs and cat bombs and rat <laughs> bombs. I mean, it's just insane. Every yeah, but, every rhyming but, animal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the bigger picture: why do nations have intelligence communities or agencies? Well, I guess the main reason especially the main reason for the creation of this OSS, the precursor to the CIA and the CIA itself, is that, well, in the U.S. case, presidents want to know what's going on in the world. What's happening abroad? That's the main impetus for creating the CIA in 1947, is Harry Truman wants to know what's going on in the world, and that's the CIA's job. Over time, it kind of took on more of the role of influencing things, covert operations, but originally its sole purpose is to figure out what's going on, collect intelligence from abroad, and have people who are back home analyzing that intelligence to determine what's happening. Harry Truman would later say that, you know, he kind of regretted that the CIA evolved into a kind of organization that would uh, uh, go into covert operations when its original mission, and he thought its only mission really should be, to collect intelligence and just keep the president informed on things so that the president can be able to make decisions with a better basis of knowledge under him. Right. When I was researching my conspiracy book, I you know just sort of encountered all these crazy stories about the CIA manipulating uh, you know fr- elections abroad and assassinating foreign leaders. And I'm like, what? Our government was doing this? <laughs> you know, did Congress know about this? Does the president know about you know? Yeah. Well, uh, well that, that's what that's one of the issues. Um, one one project I'm working on right now is going to get into this a little bit more about the the kind of problem of plausible deniability in the intelligence community. You know, some of the orders that are coming to you know we might talk about something like MK Ultra or Sidney Gottlieb, this scientist who's the head of it. It it seems the order to assassinate this guy in the Congo, uh, um, Patrice Lumumba. That mm-hmm. seems to come from Eisenhower, but it's kind of through layers of CIA people that eventually gets down to God leave. So by the time it gets down to him, it is kind of cloaked in this plausible deniability. Yeah, well, the assassination of Che Guevara uh, was a CIA directed operation, as I understand it. Uh, but they didn't actually assassinate him. It was, I think, it was Bolivian locals that did it or something. But indirectly, they were involved. But so your point is that if it gets up to the president and, and, and the New York Times sticks a mic in his face and says, what's going on? Because I have no idea. You know, this is there's six layers between me and them. I don't know. Yeah. Well, one way I like to think about this, I'm, I've kind of been working through how this works. I, I've thought of this in terms of almost a vicious cycle. I mean, organizations like the CIA inherently just have to have some secrecy to them. You can't just go telling people every secret you have. So embedded in that is some secrecy. But with secrecy comes complications. So, you know, secrecy tends to lead to this plausible deniability. So not only do we protect the secrets that we have that legitimately are secrets, but we might also try to keep secret things that we've done that we don't want other people knowing. So that can be abuse. So secrecy leads to plausible deniability. Plausible deniability leads to more risky behavior, because if you know you're not going to be held accountable for something, you're probably more likely to do something riskier. Risky behavior leads to embarrassment, because if you do do something and it goes wrong, someone is probably going to leak it to the press and it's going to be exposed and that's going to be embarrassing. But then embarrassment leads to more secrecy because you don't want Mm. anyone knowing anything else. So it's this vicious cycle that keeps going. Sort of like a ran contra, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the... um, So uh, in this project that I'm working on right now, I want to pull out several examples of how this kind of vicious cycle of secrecy plays out. Iran-Contra is one of the examples. Of course, MKUltra is going to be a big one. Iran-Contra, the CIA kind of enhanced interrogation after 9-11. That'll be another. And inherent in many of these are the destruction of documents and records. So this kind of goes along with this vicious cycle of not wanting um, embarrassment to get out there. Well, one way to prevent that, that kind of leads into this idea of further secrecy in the vicious cycle, is to destroy records. Sidney Gottlieb at the end of MK Ultra, he burns the MK Ultra files, you know, uh, for some of these enhanced interrogations. 
uh, Congress was notified that there were recordings of some of these enhanced interrogations or, you know, torture methods, whatever. Um, there was a preservation order sent from Congress to preserve these records. And what they do? They destroyed them. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I don't know. Astonishing. Yeah, it's like, I'm kind of conflicted about how to think about uh, people like Edward Snowden and the WikiLeaks. Um, I mean, I believe in transparency for a democracy to function. But on the other hand, you know, we don't live in a world where everybody has transparent democracies. We live in a world with bad actors. So it's good to have people like the CIA operating out there to find out what's going on. And I think they do need secrets. I mean, if they if everybody knew what everybody's doing, then then the intelligence system would break down, right? Yeah, 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 I agree. The the one the, the way to I hope get around this is to it's kind of like what James Madison said at the beginning of the American experiment that, you know, if if men were angels then we wouldn't need, you know, yeah. a government, but men aren't angels and so you know, he said that you need some kind of external oversight. And I, I feel like that applies to these agencies, especially some kind of external oversight. They can't necessarily just be left to govern themselves because they get trapped in this vicious cycle. That's where Congress comes in and has intelligence committees that are able to review like covert operations and determine whether this is something we might want to do or not, or provide feedback, or at least have some some kind of way of holding people accountable that might prevent them from overstepping their bounds. The problem with some of these intelligence communities, at least, well, yeah, at least since the church committee, like in 1975, after they're set up, is that they didn't really hold people accountable. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, one director of the CIA, he was supposed to report to these intelligence communities. He just didn't do it. And what happened to him? Not much, you know. So it, it was sometimes said that the mandatory briefings that the heads of the CIA were supposed to give these to these intelligence committees were more akin to just whining and dining sessions. They would meet once a year. They would have like a little supper and they would talk and that would be it. And OK, you know, we gave them our briefing. But, okay, you know, it has to have some teeth into it, actually. Mm, that's funny. Yeah, one of my favorite movies is A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson schooling Tom Cruise and his You Can't Handle the Truth speech, right? Where... You know, son, we live in a world with walls, and on those walls are men with guns. And in parties that you don't want to talk about, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall, you know. And it's like, yeah, actually, that is the world we live in. I think the speech was written by a, a liberal screenwriter who meant it to kind of make fun of that conservative position. But in fact, that's the truth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is this, this uh, you know, kind of other world out there that's not ideal, but we have to deal with in that way. So in a sense... What you're writing about here is kind of a third arm, a, a third strategy for the president is diplomacy, which is open, uh, and war, which is you know a, a preferred to be avoided, but a, a, a necessary if possible if you have to do it. But a third in between is you know intelligence agencies, CIA. You know if we can't if we can't get our way around this problem with this foreign country through diplomacy, and we don't want to have a war, well then let's just secretly go in there and get rid of the guy that's causing the problem or whatever. This is one thing that William Donovan, the head of the OSS, he kind of mentions in this the, this book, The Dirty Tricks Department. You know, he says, warfare has been around forever, and we've always, you know, we've fought on land, we've fought on sea for a long time, and, you know, we're starting to fight in the air. And he says, we need a fourth domain, the fourth domain underground, you know, so underground warfare. This is kind of the origins of the OSS as this, this uh, arm of the government that not only collects intelligence, but also does kind of secret operations, creates weapons and disguises and sabotage missions for um, the resistance forces, especially in Europe. Right. Okay. So walk us through the kind of the outline of the major characters that it developed in World War II. We got Wild Bill Donovan and Stanley Lovell and Vannevar Bush and, and these characters. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, William Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan is the man who's put in charge of the OSS, this Office of Strategic Services, like I said, the precursor to the CIA during World War II. He's appointed by Roosevelt to head this organization. He's a World War I war hero. He had been shot in the leg and earned a you know Medal of Honor. Um, and he had gone to the same law school as Roosevelt. He had run for governor of New York after Roosevelt. Um, so Ro Roosevelt appointed him to this organization, the OSS. And again, its purpose is to collect intelligence abroad, analyze that intelligence at home, but also spread propaganda and disinformation and, you know, conduct sabotage missions and that kind of thing. Donovan is looking for a scientist to head a specific branch of the OSS. Uh, and this branch would be responsible 
for developing the weapons that these secret agents were going to use abroad. This was called the research and development branch, and this is really the main focus of my book, the R&D branch, this dirty tricks department. To head this branch, he hires a chemist from New England around Boston named Stanley Lovell, kind of an unassuming chemist who at the beginning of the war didn't really know if he wanted to be involved in creating deadly weapons. By the end of the war, this is kind of one of the big arcs of the book, he is advocating for the use of like weapons of mass destruction. So he has a big kind of arc here. Um, those are a couple of the major figures in the book. Um, yeah, you mentioned Vannevar Bush. He's, a, he's kind of the unofficial science advisor to President Roosevelt during World War II, and he's the official kind of science coordinator. He's overall in charge of overseeing projects like the Manhattan Project and, you know, proximity fuses and all kinds of stuff. But he's also someone who kind of suggests to William Donovan that he hire Stanley Lovell. So that's how Lovell kind of gets that connection to Donovan and the OSS. Mm. And is the assumption that other countries are doing this, so we have to do it as well? Uh, that definitely is an assumption. In fact, when Stanley Lovell's put in charge of this R&D branch, he doesn't really know what to do. And so he's sent to England to learn from the British. They've been doing this kind of secret spycraft, tradecraft for years. So go over there and learn what kind of weapons they're doing and bring it back here and start creating those. Right. So not just surveillance and intelligence, but, but actions against other uh, actors, bad actors, in this case, the Nazis. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, that definitely is a, one, one of the big concerns. Um, uh, yeah, again, so this R&D branch is going to hopefully, you know, create these weapons that are going to help the French resistance, especially against the Germans. But also, it's, it's, uh, there, there's a, a division of the OSS called Detachment 101, and it goes to Burma, basically, to fight the Japanese occupation there. Um, so it's, it's not just a European thing, but mostly that's where a lot of it is. So interesting. All right. And this is funded by what branches of the government? Or um, Well, the OSS is originally, well, it's originally called the CO, CI, uh, COI, sorry, the Coordinator of Information. This was directly kind of under Roosevelt, but it, he kind of trans, it gets transformed kind of into the OSS. Uh, and that's put under the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, mm. in the Department of Defense. So military. Mm-hmm. But there wasn't a Department of Defense at the time. It was Department of War, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the DOD is later, right? We're going to avoid war. We're going to fight for peace <laughs> and defense, right? Okay, Division 19. That was part of that as well? Exactly, yeah. So the, the organization of this gets might be a little confusing. There's kind of a hierarchy. You have the OSS. You have the R&D branch under that. Then you have Division 19 is one of the divisions of the R&D branch. Division 19 is in charge of creating some of these weapons like time pencils. Time pencils are something you can like light a fuse and it, it'll, you know, wait 30 minutes before it blows up. You can set it somewhere. You can run away and establish an alibi. And then the time pencil will explode after a certain period of time. Division 19 is mostly in charge of those kind of explosive weapons. When you hear about stories from World War II, like bat bombs, that's Division 19. <laughs> one of the people, yeah, one of the people Division 19 hires is Louis Pfizer. Louis Pfizer is a chemist and he kind of got some renown right before World War II, because he invented napalm. Napalm's a sticky kind of jellied gasoline substance. And Stanley Lovell learns of this guy, Louis Pfizer, and he says, that's the kind of guy that we need in Division 19. So he hires Louis Pfizer. This is kind of an interesting anecdote, but when Pfizer had developed napalm, um, he was working at Harvard, and he decided to test some of these napalm bombs. And where is he going to do it at? He goes to the Harvard soccer fields and he just right on the soccer fields, blows up some of these bombs and they actually work pretty well. He gets in trouble a little bit because not actually because he blew up the bombs, but because there was an instructor who wanted the soccer fields for some drill instruction and said, get off my field. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, we're mostly used to talking about uh, napalm with the association with the Vietnam War. I guess it must not have been used in the Korean War. If it was, it it didn't get a lot of play, but right. It was, wasn't it also first used in bombing some Japanese cities before we had the nukes? Yes. Yes. It, yeah, it definitely was. Well, with the R and D branch, um, the way that napalm is mostly used is in what are called pocket incendiaries. These are little, they're almost like a wallet, a wallet filled with napalm and a saboteur could carry this and kind of throw it in a building and set it on fire. So that, that's how the R and D branch is using this napalm. And the jelly is the delivery mechanism, right? It's a, 
it, it keeps the flame burning longer so that the building actually catches on fire. Yes, and it makes sure as it sticks this kind of napalm, the jelly, it sticks to whatever it touches. So that way, it, yeah, it won't just burn up. It'll, it'll, it'll keep attached to whatever it is. Yeah, astonishing. Did any of these characters you dealt with have moral scruples about any of this? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There are several people who did. In fact, the leader of Detachment 101, that kind of OSS group that's sent to Burma to kind of fight off the Japanese occupation, he, during the war, is probably one of the most gung-ho people that I talk about. He's constantly kind of going on missions in order to disrupt the Japanese, and his people are involved in killing, you know, uh, killing people of this Japanese occupation and killing, you know, uh, spies and double agents and all kinds of stuff. And after the war, he he seems to have what we would probably diagnose today as like PTSD. You know, he he goes on a couple of rampages in grocery stores and he doesn't seem to be quite right in his head. Um, but he, he eventually seems to come out of that a little bit. He goes back to school and afterwards, he does seem to have some moral reservations about what he did. In fact, one of the, I don't know, most poignant, or I don't know what to call it, but one, one scene in the book is where, you know, in the 1960s, 15, 20 years after World War II, there's a reunion of Detachment 101 and Carl Eifler is this guy's name. They have this reunion at Carl Eifler's place. They're cooking barbecue. All of a sudden, some people notice Carl Eifler kind of standing off to the side. He's by his fireplace. He's got a drink in his hand. Everyone's laughing and talking and reminiscing about old times. And he's quiet and somber. And he says kind of under his breath, you know, if we had our just desserts, we'd all be hung as war criminals. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so there are a few people like that throughout this book. And, you know, toward the end of the book, I talk about one guy who was involved in creating um, a few of the silenced kind of weapons for uh, Division 19. And he said, if I was doing now what I did during the war, I would end up in jail with 56 consecutive life sentences. <laughs> wow. Well, that's probably true. But I guess it depends if you're on the winning or losing side of the war. Uh, yeah, reading Annie Jacobson's book on Operation Paperclip, I was struck by the simultaneous uh, trial of war criminals at Nuremberg. Uh, and at the other uh, time, other people that were doing the same thing were brought to America and offer jobs, and you get to live in this nice house and get a paycheck, and you can raise your family, and it's going to all be great. Making weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and of course, nuclear weapons, and and then the space program. Uh, and had they not, you know, the paper clip, I guess, was on the folder that meant you get to go to America, and if not, then you have to, you, you might be uh, tried for a war crime. Yeah, that you know, there's just so much hypocrisy, but it's understandable because if so, here would be the argument. It, we're doing this because the other guy's doing it. And if they're going to do it, then we have to do it. So it's the security dilemma, the other guy problem. And, you know, in the case of Operation Paperclip, if we don't get these sci Nazi scientists, the Russians are going to get them. Yeah, I think that's exactly what, what the main focus was. It's if we don't get these people, the Soviets are going to get them. Therefore, we have to get them. Uh, I, I think that's really one of the main driving factors pushing this. One thing about Operation Paperclip um, that was kind of interesting to me because it delves into conspiracy theories. And I, you know, I, I really enjoyed your latest book, Conspiracy, um, is that when people talk about Operation Paperclip, especially maybe more in the conspiracy realm, they seem to think that we got some advanced German technology that, you know, no one had ever known about before. And to, to me, it just seems like, well, it, it seems kind of odd to think that the Germans had invented I don't, some like not alien technology, but advanced thing. And that's why we really wanted the Germans because they had this thing that nobody could have come up with. But that in the history of science, to me, it just seems like, well, that's that's not how it plays out. There's independent discovery. They're all, uh, again, the common phrase is standing on the shoulder of giants. They're all kind of drawing from the same reservoir of knowledge. So the fact that one country could be so far advanced in some technology as opposed to another, to me, seems a little flawed. Do you encounter that? Oh, totally. Like with the UAPs, you know, there's three hypotheses on the table. They're aliens, UAPs, UFOs. They're aliens, or they're some super advanced Russian or Chinese technology, you know, centuries ahead of what America has, you know. Or they're just balloons and geese yeah. and, you know, whatever. Right? So I opt for the, the third third one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Chinese spy balloon kind of reinforced that, oh, it's another balloon. Okay. And then you hear these stories. Oh, well, they launched these weather balloons like hundreds a day. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so we didn't know that, right? 
Uh, but yeah, the hist in the history of science and technology, there's no way any country is ever more than six months or a year behind any other country. They they copy each other, they steal each other's secrets. The scientists working on it all read each other's papers. They go to the same conferences. They read the same journals. There was a story in World War II uh, after World War II about um, the German physicists all of a sudden stopped publishing in these physics journals mm -hmm. with, uh, about like atomic physics, that kind of stuff. And so the American physicists are like, ah, oh, this guy's gone silent. They must be up to something. Yeah, in, in fact, one of the first people, it seems, in the Soviet Union who seemed to realize that the United States might be working on some kind of nuclear atomic bomb is a guy named Gregory Flarov. And he was a physicist, and he was keeping up with publications of American scientists. And he noticed that, how come nobody's publishing about nuclear physics anymore? And so he kind of realized it must be because they've placed the stamp of secrecy on this project or on this nuclear physics. Why would they do that? They must be working on something. What's kind of the most logical conclusion of what they're working on? Probably an atomic bomb. So he kind of just deduces based on the fact that nobody's publishing, they must have this secret program. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he was right. Yeah, I had not heard that particular story. So yeah, it goes in both directions, of course. Mm -hmm. Th this uh, this also goes along with not just World War II, but kind of open source intelligence within the intelligence community. This is most of what the intelligence community is looking at is open sources, you know, that are just available publicly. So th there's one anecdote. I can't remember where I heard it, but it was about the Gulf War, and it was saying after the fact, kind of looking back, how might someone have realized that we were about to get involved in this gul Gulf War, the United States? And they were saying, if you just looked at the number of pizza deliveries that were going to the Pentagon, you might have been able to figure it out because <laughs> if we're about, exactly if we're about to launch this, you know, big counterattack or something. Well, obviously, these employees are all going to be staying at the Pentagon late at night. This is a big deal. And what are they going to eat? Well, they're not going to cook. They're going to they're going to order pizzas. So if you can just track <laughs> pizza delivery cars, you might be able to figure out when this is going to launch. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Proxy data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else is the uh, implied here? Yeah, so just more generally on that, you know, history of science and technology, you know, Matt Ridley's book, Innovation, and other people like Kevin Kelly make this point that, uh, you know, no innovation, no, no invention comes out of thin air. You know, they're, they're all built. Every single thing ever created has something just slightly different from it that came just before with a lot of different people working on it. So there's just no way that any intelligence agency can get very far ahead of any other intelligence. Everybody is as you said, uh, kind of pulling from the same pool of information. So, and that's part of their job as intelligence agencies, right? Is to stay up on all that. Yeah. And in some stuff that I'm working on right now, I've seen some intelligence officers, ref people who are working on the science and technology side of it, saying that we were racing the consumer market. You know, it's not just other intelligence agencies. We're, we're uh, you know, racing these companies to get products before they put it on the shelves for everyone else to get. Oh, interesting. Yeah, there was a news story last night about ChatGPT and OpenAI, and the uh, reporters asking, oh, the Russians and Chinese trying to get this? It's like, come on, they, they'll have it by next week, probably. <laughs> right? Surely they're working on this. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not too privy to to that kind of thing. That's a little outside my field. But yeah, I would yeah. be surprised if anyone has too much of a leg up. But you know, we'll see. Even like cell phones and laptop computer, just computers. I mean, just the, the, no company gets very far ahead of any other company. They're all pretty much the same, even though they have patents and copyright and they sue each other like crazy for ripping each other off. And still, you know, the technology is all pretty much the same. Yeah, this, you know, you wrote a book about um, Alfred Russell Wallace, right? This, this kind of goes in with the history of science of independent discovery. You know, is it a coincidence that these two people, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, happened to come up with the same similar idea at somewhat the same time? No, it's not coincidence. They were both inspired by similar things. They had both traveled the world, so they had seen biogeography and knew the distribution of species. They had both read Lyell and Thomas Malthus. So they're, they're pulling from the same reservoir of knowledge. As with science, that also ha happens with technology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, these, you know, tech uh, gazillionaires, you know, they had they not been, had they been born at a slightly different time, like the Google guys, uh, Larry and, and Sergey, had they been born 10 years later, they would have missed it all, all right? Gates, same thing with Gates, right? I mean, the Gates one with the software, you know, it's like it comes down to like the month that, you know, it was kind of, 
bubbling up. We need software for these computers that particular month, that particular year. And Gates was just right there at the right moment, right? So much luck involved that way. But it had it not been him, it would have been somebody else. And, and, and it had it not been the Google guys, it would have been some other search engine. It, th this, is, this kind of reminds me of Stigler's Law. Stigler's Law, the idea that nothing in science is ever named after its original discoverer. So oh. the Pythagorean <laughs> theorem, Pythagoras didn't, That's you know, funny. people had known this before Pythagoras or Hubble's Law. Was Hubble the first one really to come up with this? Well, Stigler's Law, again, is that no, you know, no scientific law is named after the person who originally discovered it. And Stigler said, that applies to my own law because Robert Merton came <laughs> up with this. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's right. Merton did that. Uh, Merton wrote that book on the shoulders of giants about cumulative, the Matthew effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And right, the most famous, so to those who have more shall be given. And he was doing that. The most famous scientists get more publications and more attention and more graduate students and more grants and so on, and just kind of accumulating Mm -hmm. And the guys that got left behind, well, that's just kind of the way it goes. There's also something about quotes like that. I've never heard Stigler's Law, but something, uh, I forget who came up with that one. But the quote will gravitate up to the most famous person who ever said it. Mm, right. Yeah. Yogi Berra <laughs> and Mark Twain and, you know, whoever. And, and half the time they didn't even say it. Yogi Berra even wrote a book. You know, half the things I said I never said, I think was the title <laughs> of the book. Right. And in our little circle, uh, you know, Carl Sagan's extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, you know, mm -hmm. actually that goes back to Hume's principal proportionality of evidence. But, uh, but before say, just before Sagan, there was a guy named Marcello Truzzi, who was one of the co-founders of, um, the uh, for Psychop and skeptical inquire magazine. And it was originally named the Zetetic. And he had argued, he made something like that, but it wasn't quite as snappy as the way Sagan said it. And also Sagan was super famous. And he said it on Cosmos, viewed by, you know, mm -hmm. a billion people, right? So, like, as Carl Sagan said, and I don't even bother anymore to go, well, actually, it wasn't him who, you know. <laughs> and if you want to go back to Hume, you know, no, I just go, yeah, yeah, Sagan, I quote him, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Speaking of, like, language, this kind of thing, um, I've been looking at a lot of conspiracy theories around MK Ultra, the CIA kind of mind control program. And one of the things that I typically see um, the conspiracists kind of, uh, putting out there are a lot of double entendres and euphemisms. So for example, some words they use would be like perpetrator, you know, and spell it with traitor as in T or A-I-T-O-R, like they're betraying. Oh, really? Or um, perpetrator, or, the, you know, one of the most egregious examples I saw is that they, uh, you know, they said, oh, I was at this NASA headquarters and there was a service entrance sign, you know, by a door, like a service entrance. And they, you know, refer to it as serve us in trance. So the <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So all these double entendres. And I was wondering if you had encountered this before, because it seems to fit in with like the pattern recognition, like they're wanting to mm -hmm. recognize patterns mm -hmm. in these things. Have you encountered that kind mm -hmm. of euphemistic oh, yeah. language? Oh, well Oh, all the time, right? You know, what what did he really mean when he said that? Well, often nothing, right? People just <laughs> ramble on and say stuff. I mean, sometimes maybe, but probably not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the principles of conspiracy don't attribute to malice what can be explained by incompetence mm -hmm. or just randomness, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the brain is not wired to perceive randomness very well. Uh, you know, we just make uh, in, connect the dots, make patterns out of random noise. But sometimes patterns are real, so it's a signal detection problem. You know, what, at, where do we set our hit criteria that we're going to count patterns as real or not? That's a hard problem mm -hmm. uh, in any field of knowledge. But the problem is, is that, you know, the randomness um, often rules the world, right? So you ask subjects to imagine a string of heads and tails, like a hundred, and just write them down as you would imagine them uh, coin flipping. And, you know, they'll go like heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails they almost never go more than four heads or four tails in a row. But in fact, four, five, six strings happen all the time of heads and tails. And it just seems counterintuitive. My favorite example of that is when uh, Apple released the iPod shuffle feature and that customers complain. It's not random because certain songs come up way more than other songs. Like that's actually randomness, right? <laughs> so they had to program it in to be less random. So people go, now it's random. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, w w with flipping a coin, I wonder what the amount of times in a row is at which it makes some sense to actually think it's not random. Because after, you know, if you're flipping a quarter, let's say, it hits heads 20 times in a row. After that, I'm going to think, 
actually, this isn't random because you've given me a trick coin. Like this actually isn't it's a, a quarter. A, yeah, it's a magic show. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. a trick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, Randy used to have a a, a a nice bit he did with these uh, big four big playing cards, and the playing cards are put in these opaque envelopes and put in two more opaque envelopes and put a you know what are the probabilities that I could get the you know it's one out of four twenty five percent people would do these calculations and he would pause and go no it's a hundred percent I will get it. Why? Because it's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we we often neglect that. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Back to your story. So let's get through some. Of, let's go through some of these dirty tricks. Yeah, cat bombs, bat bombs, rat bomb. I mean, these yeah. are just crazy. The cat bomb one reminded me of that the joke about you know if you put a piece of buttered toast on the back of a cat facing up. <laughs> That's exactly and it. And drop it. You know the cat and the toast will just be rotating, hovering above the floor. <laughs> yeah, I'll explain for the people listening. This cat bomb is the idea that, well, someone had this idea and they thought it would be a good idea to send it to the OSS because aren't they the ones who are creating you know these weapons for these spies? And I've come up with this great idea. I want them to create it. So they submit this proposal for an idea for the cat bomb. The idea is that, well, a cat always lands on its feet, right? So if you strap a cat, or a, a cat always wants to avoid water because cats don't like water. So if you strap a cat to a bomb and you drop the bomb out of the sky, well, naturally the cat is going to want of, to avoid the ocean and it's gonna seek to hit the ship that's in the middle of the ocean. So we just drop a bunch of these bombs with cats strapped to them, and then the cats will just naturally guide them to the ships, right? <laughs> so th <laughs> at least that's the idea. Yeah, it didn't, didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> they actually tested it. Well, Stanley Lovell was kind of forced to test. He didn't want to test this, but there was apparently some kind of uh, high-profile backer who thought, oh, this, this idea has some merit. So Lovell had to basically strap a cat in a harness and kind of say, hey, this, this mm. doesn't really do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is before PETA, obviously. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, the bat bomb. That, that's, that's almost as ineffective. Yeah, the, the, the bat bomb is the idea. Again, this goes to Lewis Pfizer, the guy who created these incendiaries. Um, this dentist named Little Adams had an idea that he thought was going to win the war during World War II. He had just visited Carlsbad Caverns and seen all these bats flying around. And he thought to himself, well, if we could strap some kind of incendiary device to these bats then they would naturally fly into the nooks and crannies of different wooden buildings, say if we released them over Japan, and they would start fires. And we could set a city on fire without having to do these costly bomber raids, without potentially missing our bombs. We don't know where they're going to land. Well, we can just use these bats. They're naturally going to find these kind of dark spaces and buildings, and they'll blow up, and they'll set them on fire. Little Adams happened to be on friendly kind of terms with Eleanor Roosevelt. So he gave her this proposal, and of course she gave it to her husband, the president of the United States. Well, you know, not knowing what else to do with this, Franklin Roosevelt gives this to none other than the head of the OSS, William Donovan, and he writes a little note attached to it, said, this man is not a nut, you need to look into this. <laughs> so Donovan, you know, I mean, who's he going to give this to? Stanley Lovell, of course, the R&D branch who's in charge of making these kinds of weapons. And Stanley Lovell kind of hires Louis Pfizer, this guy who invented napalm, to create the small incendiaries that they would attach to these bats. So the R&D branch sent out some personnel to different caverns and they swung large nets and caught a bunch of bats and they did several tests with these bats. On one of the tests, they chilled the bats into what they thought was like a hibernative state and they took them up in a plane and they dropped them, but the bats didn't come out of this chilled state in time and they ended up just crashing kind of into the desert floor. So that <laughs> didn't really work too well. On another test, they were actually strapping some live incendiaries to this bats to make sure that it all kind of worked in conjunction with each other. Some of the bats woke up a little too soon and they flew off and went into a control tower and like a warehouse and they actually <laughs> exploded and blew it up. So, you know, it seems like this bat bomb actually might have had something to it because it actually did burn down these buildings, but it was never deployed during World War II. Right. Yeah, you had that funny line in there about it, when the guy asked about the weight of a bat. How much does a bat weigh? Like 16 ounces? No, grams. It's like a piece, <laughs> like a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. So they, yeah, so, they, they had to find a good way to reduce the incendiary small enough that these bats could carry them. There, there's kind of a funny anecdote in there too, that some general was talking to little Adams and he had heard about some scientists in New Mexico working on atoms or something like that. 
And he had told Little Adams, the, the guy who came up with this bat bomb idea, and Little Adams goes back to there. He's also in New Mexico testing the bat bombs, and he's ranting to his colleagues, why are they kind of working on these atoms when we've got a good thing like the bat bomb here? They need to be funding us instead. <laughs> That's really funny. All right, there's a rat bomb. Yeah, the rat. This is actually a British invention. So the OSS and the SOE, the Special Operations Executive, this is kind of the British equivalent to the OSS. They're um, sharing a bunch of ideas during the war. One of the ideas that the SOE comes up with is this rat bomb. The idea behind it is that we want to find a way to destroy German trains, you know, locomotives. So if they're shoveling coal into their trains, maybe we can blow up their engine somehow. So the British come up with this idea. What if we take dead rats, a taxidermied rat, and we hollow it out, and we stuff it full of some explosives, and we sew it back up, and we throw these rats into the Germans' coal deposits. That way, when the Germans kind of fill up their locomotives with coal, and they're going to be shoveling into, into their boilers, they're going to see the rats, but they're not going to pick them out. They're just going to shovel it in with everything else, and these rats are going to have the explosives, so we'll shovel in the rats into the, the boiler, and it's going to explode and destroy the train. So that's the, the rat bomb idea the British came up with. <laughs> But th what, what's wrong with that? I mean, I, th th there's a certain logic to it. Yeah, th there is a logic. Th the reason why this didn't go too far is that there was a shipment of rat bombs that went out and it was intercepted by the Germans. And so they knew that they to look for these rats because they knew that rats were being used for these explosives. Oh my God, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, the OSS had a similar um, project actually called Black Joe under the R&D branch. Black Joe was almost like paper mache coal. It looked just like coal, except it was stuffed with explosives. And it was the same idea. You would throw this in a coal deposit, the Germans might shovel it into their boilers and it would explode a train. Um, but instead of rats, it was coal that was just looked like regular coal. So when they're spitballing ideas like this, they must be thinking, well, if we can come up with this, then what if those guys are doing the same thing to us? Yeah, yeah, that, that's certainly something they're, they're worried about. For Stanley Lovell, though, he's not so much interested in trying to detect the Germans doing this. He's more so interested in just spitballing ideas, throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, I th think part of it probably has to do that the majority of this fighting isn't occurring in the United States. So mm. he's not necessarily as worried as yeah. American trains being sabotaged. Yeah, of course. Right. Uh, okay. So silent pistols, camouflaged explosives, fighting knives. <laughs> yeah, one of the, one of my favorite stories from the book is this guy William Fairbairn. Fairbairn mm. is a um he's kind of a British marine and he was stationed in Shanghai for several years um on kind of a police force. His nickname was the Shanghai Buster. And the OSS hires Fairbairn to teach its recruits knife fighting and hand-to-hand -hand kind of combat techniques and Fairbairn had come up with his own combat style called gutter fighting. It is kind of a no-nonsense, anything-goes style of fighting. If you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, do anything to win. I mean, this is war after all. If you have to maim someone or kill someone, then do it. If you've got to gouge out their eyeballs, if you've got to go for their testicles or something, well, that's just what you have to do. There's no, you know, there's no boxing rules here. You've got to do whatever you've got to do to win. So that's Fairbairn style. So he, he teaches OSS recruits some of these techniques. Um, that, that was really fun to kind of research and write about because he's certainly an interesting character. <laughs> Yeah, well, again, that's, that makes sense, right? Uh, and, you know, if you have to fight dirty, well, th that's war, right? Camouflaged explosives. Yeah, that... Silent pistols. Yeah, that, the camouflaged explosives is kind of like the, uh, the Black Joe, you know, like the camouflaged mm. coal. This, they were camouflaged all kinds of stuff. Um, so the rats, the coal, logs, um, one camouflaged explosive... Probably the most famous that came out of the R and D branch is called Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima <laughs> is this uh, pancake mix. It's pancake mix, but it's mixed in with some explosive. The idea behind it is that it's hard to sneak explosives into enemy territory. You know, I mean, if somebody's going to be checking your bags, they're going to be seeing explosives. How do you sneak it in there? Well, what if it doesn't look like an explosive? What if it looks like pancake mix? And you just say, "Yeah, I'm, I'm a cook," or "I'm a, you know, whatever." And so that was the idea behind Aunt Jemima. It's this pancake mix. You can bake it. You can mold it into stuff. Um, but it also, if you set an, a charge to it, it'll explode. Right. So that's why when I flew to New York last week, they took away my shaving cream can because it was too big. It had to be like less than five ounces, and mine was the 12-ounce kind or something. I mean, it's still the same argument, right? That terrorists could make a bomb out of uh, whatever. The toothpaste tube actually has something else in it. Something like that. That that's an old idea. 
Yeah. Oh, very old idea. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, I'm sh kind of going with that technology argument. A lot of this stuff, the same kind of ideas, they don't just originate during World War II. A lot of this stuff's going back a long time. One, one mm -hmm. of the things I talk about toward the end of the book is the idea of a truth drug, like a truth oh, serum. Yeah. Is there a drug we can experiment with that'll make someone tell the truth? And the OSS is experimenting with this, and this later gets taken up with the CIA and especially like MK Ultra, its program. But this has been around for a long time. The idea that is there a certain, you know, drug or chemical we can feed to someone to make them tell the truth? I mean, this was the idea with alcohol for forever. You know, fly <laughs> right. someone with some drinks and who knows what they're <laughs> going to say. Why not? <laughs> right. That was a Seinfeld episode. One of the last Seinfeld episodes, right? Oh, was it? Where, yeah, yeah, where uh, e Elaine had, uh, she had it put in the vault, you know, her brain. She's never going to tell. And until you give her some liquor and then she spills the beans, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned this quote, um, in vino veritas. This was oh, plenty the elder. Right. Yeah, it goes back a long time. But, you know, in right. wine lies the truth. Drink a little bit of wine and, you know, somebody will get talking. <laughs> well, so the idea is inhibition, right? Mm -hmm. Normally, most of us uh, are, are inhibited for good reasons. You shouldn't just blurt out whatever you're thinking. So the drug would disinhibit that and, and let it out course you don't know what they're going to say exactly that, or not. yeah exactly that's the problem so one of the before world war ii one person who's trying to work on truth or he kind of stumbles upon what he thinks is a truth drug is a guy named robert house he's a doctor in dallas and he's you know delivering babies but he gives a woman scopolamine this drug and she ends up saying something that he thinks she otherwise wouldn't have ever said this so why did she do it maybe the scopolamine prevented her brain in some way from inventing lies. So, you know, with him, and this gets carried into the OSS, it's not just that these drugs potentially lower inhibition, it's also that they inhibit the imaginative areas of the brain, and therefore you can't invent anything, therefore when you speak it has to be the truth. At least that's what they're hoping for. It doesn't actually work out that way, but that's, you know, the, I, the goal of the truth drug isn't just to lower inhibitions, but also to prevent any lies from being said. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably not the case, right? No, yeah, that is, that's not the case. <laughs> they, uh, they tried. I mean, they, you know, experimented with a lot of stuff. One of the main things the OSS, this R&D branch is experimenting with is THC acetate. So this kind of main right. psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, they're in kind of injecting it into cigarettes and they're handing it to, you know, people for different experiments and letting them smoke these cigarettes and see if it, you know, gets them telling the truth. And it, there's actually a, an experiment they do where they hand this to a bunch of OSS personnel, and they measure the amount of words spoken per minute. And it actually mm. turns out that people who smoke this THC acetate spoke a lot more, but they could never guarantee what they said actually was the truth. So maybe it does lower inhibitions, <laughs> but how do yeah. they know that what they're saying is actually true? This, this gets well, into the problem of like torture too. You can torture someone, yeah. you can make someone speak. And you know, if you do a certain, they can speak, but how do you know what they're saying is actually the truth? And by the time you're done torturing them, well, you've kind of ruined their credibility because, of course, they would have said anything. So you can't trust anything they said anyway. So. Right. I just had uh, Amanda Knox on the podcast, and she talked about the, her, her interrogation in that uh, Italian police room where they were just leaning in on her and, and slapping her around and like 50 straight hours. Uh, she's 20 years old, has no idea what's going on, thinks that this horrible murder, uh, you know, obviously they'll know that it wasn't me. So I'm just going to blab along here and it could help them out. Right. And then before you know it, she's, you know, they're pressing, how come you did this text and what happened there and this and that. And at some point she just goes, I don't know. It's practically almost like, what is it you want me to say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> just tell me. So I, you know, not quite that, but you know, she just kind of just said whatever she could say to, to end it. And then, you know, the rest follows that, okay, then she was involved. And even though they got the DNA from the guy who actually did it, he's convicted, he's still in jail, no DNA from her at all. But the narrative from there on was that, well, look what she said in interrogation. So, you know, we're going to stick with that story. And that's, you know, back to the witch trials and, and you know, in t enhanced interrogation. Last time I looked at what few studies there are on this, like during the um, Afghan Afghanistan and Iraqi wars, did the enhanced interrogation by the CIA actually result in actionable intelligence that helped our cause? Now, of course, there are anecdotes about, yeah, yeah, we got this information and that prevented that from happening, or we got this guy who this guy told us about and so on, so that was good. But how, but what's the base rate, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, how many people did you do this to? And, you, you know, you have 1%. 
or 2% or, or is it 50%, you know? Well, and I couldn't get any accurate information on that. Mm -hmm. One of the ironies about this too, with the CIA doing this enhanced interrogation after 9-11, is that in 19, I think it was 63 or 64, the CIA published a, a report called Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation. Kubark is the agency's cryptonym for itself. So, you know, it has cryptonyms for all kinds of, well, in the 60s, the CIA, when it would refer to itself it, with a cryptonym, it was called Kubark. So this is the CIA's interrogation <laughs> manual. If you read the manual, it clearly says torture doesn't work. And this is back in the 60s. You know, it really? says if you, if, you, if you want someone to talk to you, the best way to do it is to build rapport with them. Get them on your side. Offer them something. You know, you want to build rapport. You want them to sympathize with you or let them think that you're sympathizing with them. You know, it says about torture, if you start with torture... Well, they're going to say anything, and you probably can't trust what they say. If you do everything else first, and then you end with torture, well, they know you're desperate, and so they know that if they just hang on a little bit while longer, then you're going to have nothing else to throw at them. So they can just hold out. So it says, you know, back in the 60s, torture doesn't work. One thing this, right. man one thing this manual does say that kind of ties in with some of the stuff in this book and that I've been working on has to do with hyp hypnotism and truth drugs. Um, under MK Ultra, the CIA kind of mind control program, there were there were a lot of sub projects, and one of those pro sub projects um, dealt with hypnotism and truth drugs and interrogations and whether they worked. One psychologist named Martin Orn actually that this uh, manual, this report from the CIA references, did several uh, experiments experiments with this, except he's not actually using hypnotism and truth drugs, he's tricking the interrogatees into thinking that they've been giving truth drugs. You know, so he says, if you can make them think that they've been slipped a truth drug, then it'll make them think that, well, if I speak now, it's not my fault. It kind of removes from them the guilt because it's the truth drug talking, not me. Therefore, I'm kind of absolved from telling the truth. So you don't actually need to give them the truth drug. You just need to make them think they've taken it so it absolves them of any guilt of actually talking. That's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, there was a study done by, I think it was Pete Leeson, who wrote that book on, um, on piracy, pirates. And pirates have their own economic system, their own politics, constitutions, everybody signs on. So, you know, it's kind of a, there's sort of a, you know, honor among thieves uh, type argument. But he also wrote one on witches, on the witch trials. And that, you know, just the threat of, you know, you're going to be thrown into the pond to see if you drown or, or not uh, would get people to, at least they thought would get these these mostly older women to speak the truth about what they were really doing with the the Satan or the demons or whatever. Yeah, interesting. But again, it's a signal detection problem. Do you really get accurate information? I mean, you're really getting more hits and not misses or false po worse false positives, right? Um, yeah. So I'm just kind of riffing here. So I mean, you know, like alcohol, does it really release what's in there? You know, I was just thinking of the of the um, who's the movie director Mel Gip Mel Gibson, right? Remember that story years ago? He gets pulled over in Malibu and he's drunk driving, and he's just ranting about the Jews and and women, and he calls the the police officer a female police officer sugar tits, and I mean he's just just you know. So then it's like, oh, this is the real Mel Gibson, and you know afterwards, of course, he's embarrassed and all that stuff, you know. So what is the yeah? So that's the problem. These drugs of any kind. You know, do they really release what's actually accurately in there or it, people just blur out stuff they would never say and they don't actually think that? I don't know what the answer it is to that, but mm -hmm. it's an interesting one, problem. Yeah. One of these other techniques that's pretty similar that Martin Orn discusses in this kind of CIA manual is called the magic room technique. And it, this has to do with hypnosis. So you don't actually have to hypnotize someone. You just have to make them think they're under hypnosis. So, you know, you go through the motions and you hypnotize them or so-called hypnotize them. And you tell them, you know, on the count of three, your hands are going to start feeling warm. And of course, the person inside their mind is thinking, my hands are going to feel warm. I'm not hypnotized. But then you place a heater under the desk and you turn it on and their hands actually do get warm. So while they're oh thinking God. to themselves, I'm not hypnotized, they can't deny the fact that this is actually working. Something's happening to their hands. And so if they actually think, well, maybe I am under hypnosis, again, that absolves me of guilt of talking because I had no choice. He hypnotized me. So, you know, they talk. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hypnosis is another one of those things, the hidden observer in there. It's a, it's a little it's a little bit like a dualistic argument. There's some there's a little homunculus in there that knows what's going on, right? Of course, there's no such thing, but 
maybe there's some subcortical processes of information in there that under hypnosis, you, you know, under post-hypnotic suggestions, then that comes out. Like, you know, you see these stage uh, 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 mentalists and hypnotists who, you know, say, you know, when I wake you up, you're going to count to 10, but you won't be able to remember the number seven, you know, and then they wake the person up and they have no idea what's going on. And we count to 10 and the person, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, 10. And they're like, you know, like what? Uh, let me try again. You know, and they can't, they can't seem to get it out. And it's like, are they just play acting? Are they just going along with the magician? Cause they, you know, they're on stage. They don't want to embarrass the guy or they really can't say it because the little homunculus in there is blocking it, or you know what is going on with that? This this is the problem that um, a guy named Morse Allen ran into in the CIA. The, in the MK Ultra starts in 1953. One of the precursor programs to that is called Bluebird Operation Bluebird, and it's it's looking into similar kind of stuff, mostly focused on hypnosis. Morse Allen is the one who's kind of doing some of the hypnosis. He actually hires a hypnotist to kind of teach him some of these techniques. So who does he experiment on? His secretaries in the office, because they're <laughs> right there. So he, he supposedly puts them under hypnosis, and he makes them do some incredible things. He he says in a report that he made one of them regress to when she was on vacation several months ago, and she supposedly fell out of the chair, and she had gone on a trip to Mexico, and so she was in the sea, and she gulped in a kind of breath of imaginary seawater, and she's you know flailing on the ground. And so he says this happened, and then he says... You know, I hypnotized one of them. I placed a gun on the counter and I told her, you know, on the count of three or when I snap my fingers or whatever it is, you're going to pick up that gun, you're going to point it at the other secretary and you're going to shoot her. And, you know, supposedly she doesn't know whether this is loaded or unloaded. So this is a way that Morse Allen can actually see if she's actually just faking it or going along with him. Because surely, even if she was faking it, she's not going to shoot her friend. Well, she goes and she picks up the gun and she actually pulls the trigger. It's unloaded, but supposedly she didn't know that. The problem that Morse Allen faces is that are they really hypnotized or are these just secretaries going along with what their boss says, knowing that he's not really going to put them in danger? So he, you know, he eventually concludes, well, since I don't know which one it is, then I don't know if this actually worked or not. Interesting. Yeah, I had no idea the CIA was doing all that stuff. Did you ever see Darren Brown's Netflix specials? Well, now they're I, Netflix specials. Is he the one that did the push? Yes, the push. I, I saw the push. Yeah. That's I think that's the only one I've seen. But yeah, it's similar. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah, you know. So it's like okay, man, you can get people to do this thing where they push somebody off the side of a building. Of course, they're in a harness and they just fall harmlessly. But but the steps to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just yeah, you know, a hundred different things you got to do to get the person to actually do that. You know, to me, it doesn't show that people are gullible or stupid or irrational. It shows the extent to which you have to go to get people to do things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's another story that I came across when researching kind of hypnotism, LSD experiments, and it wasn't related to the CIA, but it has to do with some of the similar stuff. And it was a, it might have been a psychologist who was hypnotizing, uh, again, I think it was a secretary, but it was in front of a crowd. He was demonstrating his powers supposedly. And he was going to hypnotize her into assassinating someone in the room. And so he had placed, you know, daggers on the desk and guns and everything. So he hypnotized her and he said, okay, you're going to go up and grab one of those daggers and stab this person. So he, you know, puts her in the trance. She goes up and grabs the dagger and she, you know, tries to stab the person. Of course, it's like a rubber dagger. And, you know, he's saying all this, now you're going to do a, a pirouette and twirl. And, you know, she does it. And then toward the end of the uh, program, someone kind of from the off the side of the stage yells, take off your shirt. And she snaps out of it and she doesn't, you know, so she, she does, she doesn't do it. So th to me, this indicated right. that, well, obviously she wasn't really in the trance. She was going along with it because as soon as something a little bit, you know, risque that she didn't want to do was involved, then, oh, I'm not in the trance anymore. <laughs> That's funny. Right. Yes, uh, the dream of all young uh, young teenagers, right? I, I hypnotize a girl to have sex with me. Probably not. That's the Manchurian candidate problem, right? Is that could you really uh, program somebody to assassinate a foreign leader or something like that? And that's that was part of the MK Ultra program, right? Uh, you know, we, the North Koreans are doing this to our soldiers during the Korean War. They're brainwashing them. And even the word brainwashing, mind control. Um, you know, to me, it's kind of problematic, you know, uh, what is it you're actually taking control over? 
And I think those experiments largely failed, right? The mm-hmm. conclusion is you you can't actually brainwash somebody. Yeah, like the, the the one of the ideas, I guess, would be to create a Manchurian candidate. Can you take control of someone's body and make them do something that they otherwise wouldn't do? That, I mean, from everything I've seen, doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, in this book, during World War II, um, Stanley Lovell is interested in this question, especially with hypnotism. Could we hypnotize some disgruntled kind of German soldier who kind of realized what he was doing was wrong? Could we hypnotize them into potentially assassinating Hitler? He consulted with a couple of psychologists, and they basically said, if this soldier wasn't going to kill Hitler before, you're not going to get him to by doing hypnosis. No, you have to have somebody that re- like uh, von Stauffenberg who realizes this is really you know, a bad idea. And we got to put an end to this whole Nazi regime. That's that's what it takes. Really, more like brainwashing the populace. Although even there, you know, it's like dropping, like in World War II, we dropped leaflets over, or in other wars, we dropped leaflets over the population, hoping they'll, you know, read that, you know, we're coming, but we don't want to hurt you. We're just trying to topple the regime, whatever. As if they can actually do something about it, right? And it's like, what am, you know, the average person, what are they going to do to overturn uh, the Nazi regime or stop uh, Putin. Like, you know, why don't ordinary Russians do something about, well, what are they going to do? You know, we see what he does to his enemies. You know, you go first. <laughs> oh, I'm not doing it. <laughs> right. It's the, it's that, what's that, 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 that thought express, uh, the belling the cat, right? The mice decide we need to put a bell on the cat so that we can hear him coming. All right. Who's going to do it? <laughs> who's going to be the one that goes over there and puts the bell on the cat? Because he's probably going to get eaten. Right. And no one wants to go first. Yeah, there, there are several kind of propaganda disinformation campaigns that this like with leaflets and stuff in the book that I talk about trying to convince, you know, the German populace that something's going on or the Japanese that something's going on. And, you know, they don't they don't seem to pan out too well. One of the ideas for Germany is to create or make the Germans think that there's this so-called German League of Lonely War Women. The idea is that we're <laughs> going to drop pamphlets over these German soldiers, and these pamphlets are basically going to say that there, there's this league that's been created in Germany, and all these women are willing to sleep with heroic German soldiers. You know, And you might think that, why would the OSS want to spread this rumor? Like, wouldn't that invigorate the German soldiers. Oh, we're going to be sleeping all the, all these women. But the idea was that we're going to make these German soldiers think that all these women are clamoring to join this league. And then the German soldiers are going to think, well, what's my wife doing? What's my gr- girlfriend doing? Are they joining this league too? And they're going to get disgruntled and upset and want to leave to go back and make sure that they're not sleeping with anyone. Oh my God, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's like Tokyo Rose, right? In the, in the other the, uh, theater, war theater. <laughs> Come on, Joe. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> Your girlfriends are back home. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I guess in time of war, people are willing to try anything. And we just didn't know much about the mind back then. We still don't know a lot about, you know, things like hypnosis are still controversial. It's still not clear what's going on. Oh, the other Darren Brown special I recommend is Miracle. Uh, or he, he's, he's kind of debunking the faith healers and all that, which is which is great. Classic skeptic debunking. Uh, and he does some regular ma- magic tricks and mentalism in the show, but he also has it, it toward the end. He does some hypnotism to show how powerful it can be it, with the implication that in a way, faith healers are doing this kind of mind trickery with their audiences. Now it's not clear to me that that that's true, that this is what they're doing, even if it's unintentional. Uh, because I know mental, I don't know if Darren Brown does this, but I know mentalists and hypnotists will often work an audience before the show starts to see who's kind of susceptible, who's not, you know, maybe you have a hundred people in the audience, maybe five are going to be really hypnotizable. Mm -hmm. The rest, maybe another 20 that are so, so, and the rest are hopeless. They'll never do what you want them to do on stage. Right. So you do these, a few little tricks like, you know, let's before the, the, the show starts, you know, raise your right hand and hold it there. Now you're going to do, the, they do little tricks like this. And then you see, that's the guy right there. We're going to call on him during the show, right? So mm-hmm. they kind of have it. So I don't know if Darren Brown does that, but I, I know other magicians have done that. Mm-hmm. So again, even if mind control sort of works, probably not on most people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, um, that it kind of go, goes along with maybe who joins cults too. I feel like there are certain tactics can work on people to 
well, for lack of a better term, it seems like almost mind control them, get them to think or believe or behave in certain ways. Um, those tactics, you, I know you had uh, Steve Hassan on uh, not too mm, long ago, mm -hmm. you know, his bite model about behavior, information, thought, and emotion control. It seems like these actually do work on people to get them beholden to the cult and to do certain things, contribute their money, devote their lives, disconnect from their entire families. I don't know if those specific things work on everybody, but I bet there is a subset where it's really powerful, those just psychological tools. Yeah, I, uh, he and I disagreed about the extent to which that applies to the population as a well. whole. He thinks, uh, you know, these cults are everywhere and like anyone who voted for Trump is in a cult and that Trump has these kind of cult mind control type powers in his speech. You know, he is a good speaker. He is, you know, he, he has almost a preternatural ability to to carry on a speech for hours, uh, you know, with endless energy. It's, it's astonishing. And at least the people that go, they do seem pretty fanatical. But I think most Republicans that voted for him, they're not in a cult. There's just like, it's more political tribalism, right? I don't like the guy, but he's a Republican and I'm a Republican. So I'll pull the handle for him, right? They're not in a cult. And, you know, Catholic Church, come on, that's not a cult. You know, people can leave anytime they want. And I've been thinking about this again, back to this kind of what extent humans are irrational. You know, most people don't join cults. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, we can name the ones that are famous and the people that fell in for it. And afterwards they tell us what happened. Okay. Um, uh, but you know, what's the base rate? How many people did Jim Jones give speeches to, you know, when he was a preacher in San Francisco, just doing social justice work? you know, probably millions. And, you know, most of them didn't go off to South America and drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, or, you know, how many people have taken the little Scientology personality test and failed <laughs> and told, oh, we can help you with that <laughs> for 50 bucks. You can take the first Scientology. You know, most people probably just walk away, right? Yeah. But we don't know how many because no one keeps data like that. Mm -hmm. And I think your, your new book, Conspiracy, it gives several reasons for why this might be. You know, you talk about like, proxy conspiracism and, you know, we say we believe this, but really mean another thing. Or one of the reasons why we, you know, uh, hold on to a conspiracy theory is more of a tribal reason. Well, because that this is what my tribe is saying, and I want to indicate that I'm a good member of the tribe. So I, I don't think it's also just that certain people might be more susceptible. I think it's that certain people, or maybe even a lot of people, are more susceptible at specific times maybe in their life. Maybe you've just gone through a heartbreak and you are looking th for another tribe to join and it just happens to land on you. So it might be that a lot of people could be susceptible to cult tactics depending on what situation they've just been through. It's just so that most people might not be in that specific situation when, whenever they're approached to join a cult. I would assume the CIA has some selective process like that. You know, Who's going to make a good spy for us? And, you know, here's the personality dimensions or demographics or, you know, married, not married, kids, not kids, you know, so you, you want this or that. I don't even know what it would be, but I would imagine it'd be something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. They definitely have to go through a kind of regimen in order to get in. I had several students when I was teaching at Louisiana, I was teaching in uh, like a cyberspace kind of program. And one of the big recruiters was like the NSA and they had to do uh, polygraph tests and all kinds of stuff, you know, just eat for, for their interviews, even to, you know, get in there. So uh, I, I know they have a selective process going through that. W one of the unintuitive things, though, about recruiting into some of these organizations is that the people you would think might make good spies would be bad for that very reason, because the whole point of a spy is to not seem like a spy. If someone seems like, oh, they're good because they're nomadic and like all this stuff. Well, that's the opposite of what you want. You want someone who's, you know, working at Radio Blend Shack. In. and Exactly. Right. Yeah. This was the problem with Mo right. Berg is this baseball player who's recruited into the story, OSS. Yeah. yeah he's that story. Yeah. Mo Berg is this baseball player and he speaks several languages. He's recruited to join the OSS during World War II. And he's really given the job of well, assassinating Werner Heisenberg, you know, this uh, German physicist and the most famous physicist. The idea was that if anyone's going to be leading a German atomic bomb project, it's going to be Moberg. Moberg is eventually sent over to Europe and he attends a lecture by Werner Heisenberg and he realizes it doesn't really have much to do with atomic bombs or anything. So Heisenberg's probably not working on this project. He decides not to assassinate him. 
But after the war, Moberg really wants more secret work. He really wants to be a part of the intelligence community. He's a vagabond. He travels everywhere. He reads newspapers obsessively. But that's the very thing that made him kind of a bad agent is that he's the type of person that everyone knew wanted to be in that kind of work, which is the exact wrong person for that kind of work. That's really funny. In the, uh, uh, the Einstein um, HBO series or whoever produced it, it's like 10 hours. It's fantastic. But they have one segment where the Mo Berg character goes to Germany to listen to a lecture by Heisenberg, and he's got the gun in his pocket, and he's mm -hmm. you know. But they did kind of show the background around, right? He was a professional baseball player, but just kind of feeling like I'm not doing my patriotic mm -hmm. duty here, mm -hmm. and I want to do something to help the nation, and here's what I can do. Uh, and I guess he was prompted to listen for certain words, key words that from Heisenberg that might indicate that they're doing this kind of uh, uh, atomic bomb research. Yeah, he was kind of told these words are taboo, like, you know, anything, if it says uranium or, you know, fission <laughs> or something like that. Heisenberg was lecturing on something else. He actually ended up after that being invited to a dinner party at which Heisenberg was also there. So he goes to this oh, dinner party. Right. Heisenberg kind of gets a little upset and he leaves early and Berg excuses himself. And of course, Berg is undercover this whole time. He's, he, he's supposed to be a Swiss student. So he spoke a bunch of languages. He was speaking in German with a Swiss accent. And he says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. I got to go too. I'll walk with Heisenberg out. So while they're walking away, he starts peppering Heisenberg with some leading questions like, oh, what are you working on? You know, <laughs> Heisenberg kind of dismisses him and doesn't, you know, say much. So Berg got the impression that he's not working on anything, you know, important. That's funny. That was the scene that they showed in that film. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's amazing. This is one of my arguments, not my argument, actually. Vincent Bogliosi made this mm -hmm. argument in his, uh, in his book on the JFK assassination, that, you know, if the FBI or the KGB or the CIA or the mafia or whoever was going to pick somebody to assassinate Kennedy, it wouldn't be a nut job like Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> I mean, this guy can't, he can't keep his mouth shut. He's a blabbermouth. He's looking for publicity, you know, and he, it's just every sign is like, this guy would never pass. Oh, that's right. And, and in, when he went to Mexico, he went to the KGB, he went to the Russian embassy where I guess there were a couple of KGB officers working the embassy and they interviewed him and they thought, this guy's a nut job. We're not going to let him go to Russia. <laughs> you know, yep. This would not be the guy you'd hire to commit the greatest assassination in history. One thing I've been thinking about in connection with kind of assassinations, Stanley Level in World War II is... Uh, forming some assassination plots in the CIA during the Cold War. Sidney Gottlieb is doing the same thing. But the more secret you're trying to keep something, it really does limit the amount of things that you can do. So when you hear of CIA plots with Sidney Gottlieb about trying to kill Fidel Castro by putting poison in his cigar or an exploding cigar, or one of the plots was, we're going to get a really fancy, beautiful seashell because... Fidel Castro likes diving. We're going to place it in the ocean where he usually dives. He's going to see it and he's going to be so tempted because it's so beautiful. He's going to have to pick it up and lo and behold, there's explosives in it. It'll kill him. You know, th these seem so off the wall, but if you want to keep something secret and not, and have that plausible deniability and not have it traced back to you, you, your only options are to resort to something really kind of weird like this. You know, it's not that you can just hire someone to walk in there and shoot them. If you, if you don't want to be traced, well, you don't have any other options. You're going to have to give them a scuba diving suit laced with tuberculosis or whatever they're doing. <laughs> I know those are crazy. Uh, yeah. So have you followed the Frank Church story and case with, with the MK Ultra, whether he was murdered or fell out of the Oh, uh, uh, Frank Olson? Frank Olson? Frank, Frank Olson, not Church. Yet. So Church is the committee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Frank Olson, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been, uh, you know, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I have a project. Oh, okay, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be picking up from where this one leaves off, basically. And uh, I'm I'm looking deep into the Frank Olson stuff. I watch Wormwood. You know, that's kind of the documentary yep. Earl Morris's yep. uh, rendition of it. I saw it. Yeah, it's a little long. <laughs> it was a little long. <laughs> I mean, I, there there are parts that I like and parts I dislike. It's kind of a mixed mixed bag. I thought right. they did a really good job of getting historical video. Some of that video I hadn't seen before. Frank uh, Eric Olson is Frank Olson's son. And he had home video of when they exhumed the body. I mean, so some of that video is really invaluable. At the same time, you know, I, I don't know if I really agree with the ultimate conclusion that Frank Olson is murdered. To me, 
it kind of seems almost like the structure of a conspiracy theory, just even if you didn't know much about it. It seems like he's starting from the premise that this murder happened, therefore we have to interpret all the evidence in light of that. So because he's murdered, therefore there must be a motive for why they murdered him. So he must have been against like us using biological weapons in the Korean War. So we must have used these biological weapons and he was against. So all of a sudden you're like, oh, this whole thing gets really com convoluted. The simpler explanation is just, he got given this LSD and he went crazy and he jumped out a window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Just to, uh, to set it up for our uh, listeners. So this was the newly launched MK Ultra. They're doing experiments with LSD, which had been discovered in, what, 1941 by the Swiss chemist... Uh, uh, Hoffman. Hoffman, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Hoffman. And they thought this might be one of those drugs that releases the truth out of people or mind control kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So with Frank Olson, the idea is that the CIA gets a hold of this drug, LSD. Sidney Gottlieb, the head of MK Ultra, he decides to do a kind of unwitting experiment at this, at this uh, retreat. There are some members of the CIA under Gottlieb there. There's some members of Fort Diedrich, which is kind of the biological warfare laboratory of the United States. So these scientists meet at this uh, camp. It's called Deep Creek Lake. And they're there for a retreat. And in the middle of the proceedings, Gottlieb and his underling, Robert Lashbrook, decide to spike the liquor with some LSD and they start passing around drinks. Everyone, you know, drinks up, and 20 minutes later, Gottlieb says, I want to inform you, you're now part of an experiment. Everyone's been dosed with LSD. Um, you know, so they start seeing colors and lights, and the room starts spinning. And one of the people who's there is this person from Fort Diedrich, Frank Olson, kind of a bacteriological warfare specialist. After this happens, he goes back home, and his wife kind of notices, like, he seems to be a different person. Other people at work notice that Olson is acting very strange. He's very uh, kind of paranoid. He's worried. He, work, he works for the CIA, right? Uh, he worked for uh, Fort Diedrich. It, they kind of collaborated with the CIA. Yeah, he, he, he was in a, a group called the Special Operations Division, which was in charge of like biological aero, uh, delivering biological substances through the air. Uh, but they collaborated with the CIA pretty closely. Um, so yeah, people notice that he's, he's paranoid. Um, some of his colleagues take him to New York to see a psych, uh, well, yeah, a psychologist, basically, Harold Abramson. And Abramson had connections to the CIA. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of ideas about why they might have taken him to see Abramson and not someone else. But eventually, Frank Olson is staying in this hotel. And one night he goes out the window. You know, the, the kind of traditional story is that this LSD caused him to have some kind of like reactive psychosis. It tr kind of triggered something in him and he basically went crazy and he jumped out this window and he committed suicide. The, uh, the other story that's kind of most vocipor vociferously advocated by Eric Olson, who's Frank Olson's son, is that the CIA wanted to kill Frank Olson. Frank Olson knew something and he was possibly going to tell the public. You know, he... he he didn't like maybe what they were doing at his job with his biological weapons and thought that this was a bad thing and he was going to expose it. And so they had to get rid of him. And so they threw him out the window and covered it up and make it look like he just went crazy. So that's the kind of overview of the... Yeah, yeah. The worm, Wormwood plays out both scenarios in that final episode. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Eric Olson's you know, take on that. Of course, he feels strongly... About it, and the CIA did, did pay off the family, right? Didn't they give him like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that? Yes, without yes. without admitting any culpability in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was. Uh, I think President Ford issued an official apology on behalf of the U.S. government, and they were awarded yeah seven hundred fifty thousand. And in exchange, they kind of agreed that they wouldn't pursue this further or sue the CIA, something like that. Yeah, yeah, and the justification was it dosing him without his consent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, something like that, yeah. yeah. But well, even in, we... in Wormwood, again, it has good interviews with Eric Olson. Not necessarily that I agree with everything he says, but it's really good material for me to see what Eric Olson thinks about this. So I like the mm -hmm. documentary in that sense. But you know, some of the some of the arguments he makes or evidence he alludes to doesn't sit that well with me. One of the things he mentions in an early episode is about Sidney Gottlieb, this head of MK Ultra. He was connected with assassinations, you know, and Fidel Castro and Patrice Lumumba and these other people. But 
he was only connected with those a decade after this Frank Olson thing. So, you know, with hindsight bias, it's like, well, of course he was connected with that, but he wasn't connected at the time the Frank Olson thing was going on. That was a decade later. He didn't even know he would be connected with assassinations for 10 years. But there, there are a couple of things like that. I thought, I don't know if that really sticks too well. Yeah, you know, it's the, 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 the part of the problem is that narrative story that kind of makes sense after the fact is so gripping. Right? It's like the, the Jeffrey Epstein suicide slash murder. You know, what would be the motive? Well, he had the blacklist of the you know famous, rich, powerful people that he took to the island. And, they, you know, they had sex with these underage women and he filmed them all and he's got the list. And, and uh, so that, that's why they murdered him. Well... That's a plausible story. I mean, it's one of those stories. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. But did that actually happen? There's no evidence for that at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that that's kind of like what I mentioned with the biological warfare use in Korea. You know, the idea that Frank Olson might have known about this and was going to expose it or something. So therefore they had to kill him. Well, I don't I don't I don't think I've seen any good evidence that the U.S. actually used biological warfare in Korea. I don't I don't think that happened. Not that I've seen. I, there there are. American airmen who said that they did it, but they were tortured. So of course they said it because the Koreans had captured them. And, you know, so what's the reason for thinking the U.S. had used biological material on Korea? Well, because that's the only thing that makes this murder make sense. Well, they, he, they had to have used it because otherwise my dad wouldn't, you know, eh, it, to me, it just seems like you're, it's like a post hoc rationalization. Of course, we had to have done that because I'm starting with this belief. Therefore, that's the only thing that would make it make sense. Now, I'm not exactly sure if that's the logic that Eric Olson is using, but to me, it kind of seems like that might be going on. It is something like that. Yeah, Amanda Knox talks about that as well. Once they had the prosecutor in her case had in mind that she was involved in some weird sex triangle, then everything was through the lens of this Foxy Noxy, she's a sex addict. And, you know, that how come there's no DNA of her or the boyfriend in the room? Oh, well, they wiped it all clean and left only the perpetrator, the other guy, is DNA. It's like, how would they know which, to, where to wipe? I mean, you can't see DNA, right? I mean, this would make her like the the, the, the greatest crime scene, uh, you know, expert ever. You know, it's just, but, but they stuck with that because they had that narrative in their head. Another example from Wormwood, it seemed to me, is that two of the people who initially accompany Frank Olson to New York to see this psychologist are Robert Lashbrook and Vincent Ruitt. So two colleagues. They come back on Thanksgiving because they want to spend Thanksgiving with, with their family. But as soon as they get back, Frank Olson kind of goes into a paranoid state and they realize, well, we've got to return to New York. He's not in any kind of state to see his family. So Vincent Ruitt says, I'm going to go and tell the Olsons, you know, Alice Olson, his wife, what's going on. So I'll stay here. You and Lashbrook, y'all continue on to New York. And it seemed like in the documentary, they kind of painted that it says this was a way for Vincent Ruitt to avoid, avoid culpability because he was staying behind and he knew it was going to happen. But to me, it's like, well, I think he was staying behind because he wanted to tell the wife why her husband's not going to be there for Thanksgiving, even though they had already told her that he would. I mean, there's a, a plausible explanation for why he's staying behind. He's telling his wife, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Occam's razor applied there, the simpler explanation. Again, don't attribute to malice, which can be explained by other things like randomness and, and simpler explanations. Yeah, it's an interesting problem. Well, so, but we do know that the North Koreans did do these, it did attempt to do mind control and torture and so forth on our prisoners. So there's a kind of logic behind the CIA going, well, we better catch up with their technology. There was something like this, Randy wrote about this, that uh, with psychics, you know, the fear that the Russians are developing ESP and the telekinesis, and we better uh, close that gap, like the missile gap, but the psi, it's called the psi gap, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that was one of the main motivations for the people behind MK Ultra. There were several kind of reasons that they used to say that, well, of course, the Soviets or the Koreans or the Chinese have this um, ability to use mind control. And we have to figure out if that's possible and if they have it. Therefore, we have to we have to, you know, do these experiments. You know, so one one of the motivating factors would be if the Soviets really are using LSD to control people or to at least just make people act incoherently, we should know what the effects of this drug is. So for instance, what if the Soviets drug a water treatment plant with a bunch of LSD and it goes into a city and all of a sudden people are, you know, in imbibing this water and going crazy? Shouldn't we know how people react unwittingly to LSD? 
So that's one of the justifications for we have to do unwitting experiments because if that's done to us, we need to know what it looks like so we can prepare for it in, in case it does. At least that's a justification for it. Yeah, and there's that's logical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense. Now, after the after the fact, you can kind of say, well, you know, I mean, how likely is it that the Soviets had this or were going to do this? Um, but I mean, I can actually I, I can empathize with a Sidney Gottlieb and understand why he's wanting to do this. I think he has good intentions. I think he wants to help his country. There are some people who are involved in MK Ultra and even this OSS R and D branch that I talk about that kind of carry over into those programs that I think were in it for not those <laughs> kind of patriotic reasons. George White is the main example. George White is the guy who ran Operation Midnight Climax within, within MKUltra. This is where there were, the CIA kind of funded these safe houses where he would get prostitutes to dose their clients with LSD. And he, meanwhile, he was watching behind a two-way mirror and recording what's going on and getting drunk off of liquor that he had bought with CIA funds. <laughs> Uh, I think he was in it just for the fun, basically. I think he was just kind of a sadistic person, and that's what mm -hmm. he enjoyed doing. Um, but several other people, I can at least empathize and see they thought they're doing something good, so, you know, th they've got that. But, yeah, yeah, I still think the experiments themselves seem to be pretty unethical. <laughs> and 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 remind us how, how we know all this. This was came out from the church committee investigations of originally the assassination of JFK, but then what else was the CIA doing? Yeah, so in 19, well, really in, at the end of 1974, the Ford administration set up what's called the Rockefeller Commission. And this um, released some of the first information about what was going on within the CIA. These are the, this, is the, this commission released the report that kind of exposed the Frank Olson incident. This scientist died after being in, given the, you know, this drug. After that Rockefeller Commission, you have the Church Committee and you have the Pike Committee. These are looking into past abuses by the CIA and other agencies in the intelligence community. And so they release reports. They conduct hearings where they interview some of these people. And then there was a former official at the State Department named John Marks, and he filed a Freedom of Information Act uh, uh, request requesting any material related to this MKUltra program that had just been publicized on the news. And he got back several boxes full of about 6,000 documents it was mostly financial documents, but it detailed a lot of the stuff that's going on. And he used those to piece together who, you know, the people that were involved. Um, but because, of course, before they were released to the public, most of the names were kind of blacked out. Um, but he was able to kind of triangulate who some of these people were and interview them. That led to his book, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate, which was kind of the seminal book on MKUltra up until fairly recently. And uh, so that, that's how a lot of the information came out. A lot of it from this Freedom of Information Act request where, where all these documents are released. And like I mentioned before, when Sidney Gottlieb retired from the CIA in 1973, he incinerated his documents, but he forgot to incinerate these six boxes. They were at a different record center, and so those actually survived. So there's a lot of stuff we probably don't know, but there's actually a lot of stuff we do know, you know? So a lot of people like to point to MK Ultra and say, oh, it could have been... You know, they could have had Manchurian candidates and they had sex slaves and they were hunting people and government compounds and all this stuff. And it's like, I, I feel like the reason people say those things is because they can point to the fact that Gottlieb destroyed the documents. Therefore, we don't know what happened. So anything is possible. It could be anything. When in fact, we actually know a lot about this thing. There were congressional investigations and hearings and interviews and these documents actually were released, at least some of them. So I feel like we have a decent picture of MKUltra, but because he destroyed the documents, that always has left open the door that anyone can fill in the gap in the historical record with their imagination. Because, hey, it could be anything. He could have destroyed this evidence that shows that they actually did this. <laughs> That's funny. Yes. They destroyed the evidence for the aliens. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the lack of evidence is evidence <laughs> that, that it actually existed, right? <laughs> That's really funny. There, there's there's one LSD experiment that I can't hardly not tell the story. I haven't been able to tell it anywhere else, so I, I want to oh, tell yeah, it go here. For it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was I, I was going through some records that I found, and it was talking about an army LSD experiment where they would dose you know army personnel with LSD just to gauge their reactions in case what if the Soviets did this on a battlefield and you know our people are dosed with LSD, how are they going to react? We've got to figure it out. So there are these two army personnel. And they're put in a padded room and they're given LSD and they're not told anything. They're basically just told, well, we're just going to watch you. So just stay in here. So, of course, after a little while, they start seeing colors and the room is spinning and the LSD is starting to take its effect. One of the 
an army personnel in there. He reaches into his pocket and his pockets have nothing in them. And he pulls out what looks to be like something, but nothing's in, it's just an empty hand. But, you know, it, to him, apparently, it's a cigarette pack. It's a pack of cigarettes. So he opens it up and from his other pocket, he pulls out what appears to him to be a cigarette lighter. He puts a <laughs> cigarette in his mouth. He, yeah. you know, he lights it. He starts smoking a little bit. And of course, nothing's in his hand. Then he turns to the colleague that's sitting in there in the room who's also been dosed with LSD, and he kind of straightens up a little bit, and he pulls out the pack again, and he puts his um, empty hand up to his colleague and says, uh, you know, basically offering, would you like a cigarette? And uh, the colleague looks at it, and of course there's nothing in the hand. He looks and he says, um, no, I, can't, I couldn't, I couldn't take your last one. <laughs> He's like imagining. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> The nature of reality. What is it really? <laughs> <laughs> the shared hallucination. Yeah. 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 That's so interesting. What else were they up to? Well, probably a lot more. Well, so this was this uh, debate a few months ago when, when Congress released the almost the remaining JFK related papers and there was nothing in there, uh, you know, that was in incriminating to anybody. And so, you know, that kind of, well, th they must be holding something else back because it wasn't quite, if it, so my take on it was they probably were just up to other things that they'd rather we didn't know, like rigging South American elections or assassinating some foreign leader, nothing to do with Kennedy, just, you know, just their shenanigans of spying on other countries that would probably, some of which are probably now our allies and they probably don't want them to know, wait, you were doing this to us back in the seventies. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of one of my pet peeves when, you know, when I start digging into these MK ultra type conspiracies is that a lot of them come back to the fact that in no proof is offered, but the lack of proof is used as evidence of proof because of course they're covering it up. So of course the fact that I can't produce proof is proof that I actually have something because they wouldn't let me release it to you, you know? So it's like, well, it can't be proved and it's impossible to disprove. Then I don't know. It just doesn't really pass muster mm -hmm. with me. Right. Absence of evidence is evidence of absence or not. It's hard to say. Depends on the claim. Yeah. I remember that when I tell this story about, um, you know, UFOs, well, where's the evidence? Well, they're hiding it. That's how we know that UFOs are real. Okay. So dur during, uh, after the Iraq invasion and the UN inspectors went in there and they couldn't find any weapons of mass destruction. Well, that's how the Bush administration initial response. That's how we know they have them because they moved them. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> so the lack of evidence means, you know, that what, <laughs> I mean, the ufology nuts make that argument, but the U S government. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I did have another question if you don't mind, it's a little, uh, kind of tangential, oh, yeah. but yeah, yeah. you, you've written, uh, you wrote the biography, right. Of, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. Uh -huh, yeah, um, yeah. how was that writing experience compared to writing a more like thematic book, like your latest one conspiracy, you know, is it the shift from maybe a more narrative approach to thematic approach, because I've, I've just written this book and I really enjoyed writing, but, um, I, I want to get other people's perspectives on how, how did you make that switch and how did you think about the narrative versus oh, thematic differently? Yes. I had never written bi bi biography before and I didn't know how to do it. And I hadn't written much that in, in any case, uh, in terms of, you know, nonfiction thematic books. I read um, a lot of, I read several biographies. I listened to several biographies. The guy that wrote the biography of Teddy Roosevelt, I forget his name now, it's like the definitive biography, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, we should look that up. But, I've, but anyway, he's just such a great writer. He also did one of Reagan that wasn't, Edmund wasn't Morris? so good. And it, um, yes, Edmund Morris, mm -hmm. that's it. And he is a great writer. So I just listened to that and, and just like tried to inculcate in my head that style of writing and kind of narrative storytelling that has some action to it. Of course, Teddy Roosevelt's a bigger than life character, so that helped. Um, but, uh, you know, just kind of the unfolding drama uh, where the reader is going along with you on this journey. So I tried to do that with the Wallace biography. I don't know how successful I was at it, but, you know, that was, it was originally my doctoral dissertation was how Darwin and Wallace differed on different aspects of natural selection and sexual selection and so on. Then that became the biography. But that's the only biography I've written. I was going to write one of Gould just before he died. I was I had talking to him about it. And then after and then after he died, so anyways, long story short, it just didn't work out. And then somebody else was going to write a biography of, of Gould, but his his widow was, you know, not too keen on any any uh, any kind of disclosure of you know family dynamic whatever. 
Anyway, I thought, yeah, in any case, that's too soon, right? You know, you don't really know the effects of somebody's life for a while. Like I was just thinking about this with Stephen Hawking. You know, there's been some books about memoirs and so on, but we really don't know what the effects of Stephen Hawking's life will be probably for decades or even a century until kind of the science works out. Oh, now we know that, you know, Hawking anticipated this or whatever. You don't really know the effects of somebody, which is why I'm always amused by people, you know, like Prince Harry, you know, writing his memoir. You know, what, you're 30 something, 40 years old? What what do you know? You don't know what your life means at this point, Mm. right? I I I mean, you have to have some. Some perspective. I heard a joke about, I think it was uh, Gibbon. Didn't he write the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? Somebody yeah. asked him, well, what's been the long-term effects That's of the right. Roman Empire? And he said, <laughs> too it's too soon to, to sell. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. Yeah. Yeah, same thing with uh, the French Revolution. It's hard to say. We need another couple centuries. Yeah. The, the opposite yeah. joke to that would be, I, I've heard this said about historians, that Historians can't predict the future. You know, it's too complicated. We don't know what's going to happen. But once the future, you know, once we're looking toward the past, once we get into the future, we look back and like to tell you why it was inevitable. You know, so <laughs> right, we don't know what's yeah. going to happen. But once it does happen, yeah, exactly. oh, this is how it had to have happened. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's no objective history in that sense. It depends on, you know, the angle or perspective you're taking and why you're interested in that particular topic. Thematic books, you know, I just try to pick something that I'm A, really interested in, B, that I think are important. Uh, and that other people are interested in because you get you know you spend years researching and writing you got to really be interested in the topic mm-hmm. your next book i mean this is super important there's just there hasn't been that much on mk ultra there was that one book uh, sort of a biography of of um sydney gottlieb, name? The, sydney gottlieb mm-hmm. uh, the poisoner in chief yeah you re- you wrote a review of of that for us yeah yes i think there needs to be more i don't know if there's more archives to be found well i'm happy uh, to say that i found a, a lot of good stuff yeah you did for this next oh, one good. yeah it's uh, i don't you know i, I don't want to say too much yet i want to i want to under promise and over deliver um good. but i've i've got i've been very fortunate i've got a grant from the national endowment for the humanities to write this next oh, wow. book that's going to take place nice. it's going to pick up where this one ends off it's going to cover mk ultra but also the aftermath and kind of it's going to look at a lot of the after effects, the victims and suing the CIA and a lot of drama, courtroom, you know, interrogation stuff going on. It's going to be really exciting, I think. Super interesting. Oh, boy, I can't wait to read that. So just in short, in response to the revelations in the 70s through the church committee and so on, did Congress pass some legislation or laws like, hey, you guys can't do this or restrictions on the CIA or we need new rules of engagement or whatever. Yeah, there there were. Um, so this is when the the two main like committees for intelligence oversight were kind of started. The House uh, committee and the Senate committee. Um, the problem with that though is that the CIA wasn't necessarily required to inform all the members on the committee or even other committees about what was going on. So if if you had a few. Um, agreeable members on the committees, then you could inform them of what was happening. And then, you know, nobody in Congress still knew and nobody would hold you accountable, you know? So there, there, there were way other laws implemented to try to get around this. One was that it required the president to disclose to Congress, or it, it required the, the president to sign off on covert operations. So if the president actually signs off on a covert operation, now they don't have plausible deniability. They actually have to think this isn't going to backfire because it's going to come back to me because I actually have to give my sign off. Another um, kind of measure of oversight afterward was that the Senate had to confirm the CIA inspector general. Beforehand, that wasn't the case. You can appoint an inspector general and maybe you'd appoint someone friendly who wasn't going to look into stuff or maybe you'd appoint someone who feared for their job and so they weren't really going to investigate too much because they knew if they did, they're going to get fired. So now, you know, the inspector general had to be confirmed. There are a couple other measures like that. Again, the problem is that even if these measures were in place, sometimes they were just ignored. <laughs> sometimes people still didn't follow them and there still wasn't much accountability. You know, the, the way around that, to me, it seems, is that you have to incentivize Congress members to actually want to hold people accountable. And I think, I, I think the way to incentivize that is to kind of re-incentivize the uh, election structure so that they're not so preoccupied with, you know, el- their election campaigns and more preoccupied with actual governance. I know you've been kind of interested in the, in the forward party, but I think some of those reforms are, 
definitely needed. Open primaries, ranked choice voting, proportional representation, something like that, so that the incentives of the legislators are actually re are changed. And one, once those incentives are changed, I think that a lot of after effects are going to follow, including, well, now that we're incentivized to not be so selfish for re-election campaigns, we're more incentivized to actually do service to impress the people who are voting for us, to appeal to the moderate majority and not kind of the ideological fringes. So I think those reforms are kind of one way to help oversight of the intelligence community just go back to the basics. What are the incentive structures of people in Congress? The after effects are gonna be big, and I think include oversight. Right, maybe you need committees that don't have elected officials to do the investigation. So they don't have the wrong motive. Yeah, I mean, uh, representatives is just served for two years, right? So half your service is just campaigning for the next one, right? Yeah. So uh, six years seems good, but you know that's a little risky because it's pretty long. Also, if you get somebody that's no good in there, uh, was it was it President Ford who passed the bill about uh, prohibiting the assassination of foreign leaders? Yes, this was a an executive order. I think that was Ford. Order, right? Yeah, it, it was said, um, I forget the exact phrasing, but it was no kind of member of the U.S. government should be involved or encourage the, there, there was a specific phrasing to it. Um, it was, I think it said political assassinations. The idea behind having that specific phrasing is that it is still allows for the killing of certain individuals. You know, it, you could kill, say, a terrorist, and that's not a political assassination because they're not right. technically a head of state. You know, so there, there's right. certain phrasing in there that makes it a little vague. Yeah, Osama bin Laden, yeah, he's not a head of state. He's not a politician. He's not a country leader. Yeah, right, exactly. Hmm. <laughs> but if it, why do you need an executive order? Because it's it's been going on, that's why. We don't want people to <laughs> yeah. do it to me. Yeah, yeah. They, they, <laughs> I, the quote about this, it goes back, regulations are written in blood. So if something bad happened, that's why I regulate. It right. was written in blood, you know. <laughs> right, right. I often wonder what else is going on now, like related to Ukraine and Russia, say that we won't find out about for 20 years. Mm -hmm. you ever yeah. wonder that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wish I, I mean, as a historian, especially, I live in archives. I love documents. I want to know what's going on. I, I like the treasure hunt of it. You know, I feel like an explorer or a, you know, a private detective and I'm trying to figure out, connect the dots. And I, that, it's exciting to do that. And I feel like that's what a historian does. You know, I'm looking for documents and I'm trying to find out what's the thread. And so I, I love that. So yeah, I, I would like that to happen, but uh, I wouldn't expect it anytime soon, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then how do you know where to stop the story? Like you stop just before MK Ultra, and then your next book's on MK Ultra. Okay, good. You know, what you just have a feeling like, okay, this story is it has a good ending or the book is long enough or yeah it can be difficult i mean i originally went into this book wanting to do almost like a dual biography of stanley lovell and Sidney gottlieb and really compare their programs stanley lovell in world war ii is involved in creating the weapons documents disguises truth drugs he's involved in assassination plots on foreign leaders and all that stuff Sidney gottlieb is doing that exact same stuff during the cold war and i thought that would make for a really good parallel in a book but you know, the more I researched into Stanley Lovell, I thought, you know, this is getting a little bit longer and it is it is kind of a contained whole and it just made more sense to kind of split it and now I'll do the second one. But th this does get to the problem with history in general is that, I mean, historians pick and choose what ends up in their books. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I could have included in this book that I didn't. I think this makes for a good story and I think I captured the essence of the truth of what happened. But if I actually wanted to capture every single thing that was happening within this R&D branch, then I would be writing for the next hundred years. I mean, there's just, there's too much stuff. <laughs> right, so it, right. it is, a, you know, I mean, I, I want to be objective. You know, I want to capture, like I said, the essence of what happened, but I also want to tell a good story. And so that is necessarily going to influence the kinds of things that end up making it in the book. But at, at a certain point, I had to just decide, this is long enough, you know, I've got enough for another book, I'm gonna cut it off here. <laughs> and it allowed me to end the book on kind of a teaser too. I end it with the last chapter talking about Sidney Gottlieb and MK Ultra and its connection to Stanley Lovell. And so I feel like that that's a good place to end it, to tease into another project I'm working on. Nice, nice. Maybe for, maybe you write a trilogy and the, and the, the third one would be on 21st century spy uh, the technology and in and, and mind warfare and stuff that I'm sure it's still going on. Yeah, I, I'm sure. You know, there are a couple uh, devices that I've come across that are really, really intriguing. I don't think I'm going to write about them, but, 
you know, I'm interested in like the R&D weapons that were created in World War II. That's neat. There are some other stuff that I've come across more recently that's really ingenious. One of the things I uh, found was the idea of this laser microphone. The idea would be that, say we're talking in a room. Well, our speech is just vibrations. And so those vibrations are going to impact the glass on a window. So if you're outside and you shine a laser, that laser is going to be bouncing off that window depending on how that mm. glass is vibrating. It's almost like a needle in a... Needle on a record, uh, yes. On a record, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, so with a laser microphone, you might not be able to hear what's going on inside the room, but if you can you know, bounce this needle off the window and get kind of the, the bouncing that's happening, you might be able to re, uh, recreate that audio that's happening inside. Sure. Stuff like that is, it's a yeah. simple concept, but it's so incredible. <laughs> well, that's how uh, telephones originally worked, right? Uh, you know, the what you have, a, if, you, if you unscrewed the little mouthpiece, then there was, you could see a little piece of thin plastic that vibrated. Mm -hmm. And so the voice vibrations was transduced into electrical signals and then it went through the, the wire, which is much as like how our ears actually work, <laughs> sort of. And uh, yeah, so that, uh, yeah, there must be tons of stuff like that. We just don't know. But again, you know, the history of DARPA, also super interesting. You know, this is, this is again, back to the UAPs. There's no way that DARPA does not know what the Chinese and Russian drones are like and are able to do and ours are able to do. And there's no way. This is what they do for a living is think of new technologies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, very good. All right, John, that was great. We almost went two hours. The Dirty Tricks Department, there it is. Great read. Again, like a Tom Clancy novel. You should actually work on getting a documentary uh, b based on this. A good Netflix documentary would be great. I, or a I, drama. If anyone's <laughs> listening who wants to <laughs> wants, wants involved in that, I'm, I'm all ears. Oh, yeah, it'd be great. All right, all right, very good. So we'll have you on for the next book whenever you're done. You're probably just starting the research on I'm that. I'm starting so the research, yeah, I'm years. starting the writing. I would love to. What does it take, about three three years turnaround I think, for research I think and writing? I think it'll be a couple years? years for me, yeah. I, I've been I've been kind of tangentially working on this other project, too, while I've been working on this one because they're, they're related in a certain way. And so I've got a lot of background kind of research already done. So I think it should be a couple of years. Um, but I can't thank you enough for having me on. Like I said, I've been no, a yeah. long time fan of the podcast. Well, I listen you. to most episodes and your books really? have been, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I really enjoy them. And, uh, thank your you. books have been really, uh, influential too. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Really. I do. <laughs> Thanks.